Hello and welcome back to the Middling Along podcast. I'm your host, Emma Thomas, and today I'm joined by Natalie Liu. She's a writer, speaker, podcaster, artist, and founder of one of the longest running self-help blogs in the world, Baggage Reclaim, and the Baggage Reclaim Sessions podcast. She helps people understand how their emotional baggage is interfering with their ability to live their lives happily and authentically. And we're going to be talking about her latest book, The Joy of Saying No. Welcome to the podcast, Natalie. Thanks for having me, Emma. So you describe yourself as a recovering people pleaser. Um, I think we might have at least that in common. I think um, getting to perimenopause certainly means that that you kind of you you realize that you can can say no to things and and actually you have to say no to things <laughs> perhaps a bit more than you you had normally but can you sort of tell us about your your sort of your journey to discovering your your no the fact that you could have this sort of wholehearted no yeah i think um i i've been people pleasing for as long as i can remember um and at one point it felt as natural to me as breathing And it's great that I'm able to say that now because I think, of course, as a recovering people pleaser, you still have your instances of it, but it it feels uncomfortable, like you're more likely to notice it. Mm. So I spent, you know, all of my childhood and into my 20s really struggling to say no. It was sort of like, oh, I'll I'll reserve that for when somebody's made me really, really mad or my back's against the wall, or I've exhausted myself. A nuclear option. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it was never like, oh, I could just say no, just because. And it took being very unwell with an immune system disease in my sort of mid to late 20s uh, called sarcoidosis. It's like a, it's a, one of those chronic immune system conditions. Mm. That really sort of brought me to my knees because that's like your body turning on itself. That, you know, it affected my sight my spleen, it was, it's very systemic. And it was continuing to plow on as if I was not that ill and still (laughs) trying to perform really, Might be ringing some bells with a few people listening. (laughs) I'm still trying to be all things to all people. I think that that was really sort of what pushed me into that zone of finally learning to say no, because what happened was, I was diagnosed. I was going into hospital most weeks at one point, but I actually kept it a secret from work. Like I didn't kind of reveal the extent and I masked it all with my perfectionism and people pleasing by really overperforming at work as if to compensate for being ill, like it's some sort of, you know, sign of failure or laziness on my part. And it took getting a damning prognosis about my illness where they basically said, you know, go on steroids for life or be dead by the age of 40 type of thing where it was like, oh, hold on a second. Something's really wrong here. I need to change. And that was that was August 2005 that I was given that diagnosis and I pursued sort of alternative health options because I'd already done a year of steroids and mm-hmm. that was clearly not, not working very well. Mm-hmm. And I do find, and this is part of what we experience with perimenopause and with menopause as well, that there can be, and this is not about slagging off the the medical system, but there is this tendency, I think, particularly with women. And then when you add in other factors as well, that can become progressively worse, whether that's about disability or race or, but there's a tendency to palm you off with something else so you go in about what are actually your perimenopause or menopause symptoms and they tell you oh here's some antidepressants you know um in my case i had been told actually that i was a hypochondriac it actually took my my eye practically hanging out of my head um for them to go oh wait actually this is not conjunctivitis and she's not a hypochondriac and then it was palming me off with steroids and then telling me that i didn't have any options and it was all of that that really forced me to reevaluate my life and to start learning to say no, because I realized that if I'm going to go to the trouble of doing, for instance, kinesiology and acupuncture and change my diet, it's all very well doing all of these things. But if you walk out of there where you do these things, but you also still don't say no when you need one to and should, then you're still going to have the same problems because you're still going to have the same stresses. Mm-hmm. And stress is a major component in our life that affects what's going on in our body. And so since then, since 2005, I have, whether consciously or not, been a recovering people pleaser who has basically learned how to listen to her body, to listen to herself 
and to use that to guide the boundaries that I need to create with people and to learn to say yes and no more authentically. Mm. And, and as women, uh, or those who identify as women, we're, we're basically socialised into this kind of uh, being good, being compliant, helping, mm-hmm. doing all the things. Yeah, I guess sort of stepping back from that feels very alien. And also, I think there's that sort of sense of, well, if, I, if I'm not people pleasing, mm-hmm. am, am, I a bad, am I then a bad person? Am I does that make me selfish? Does that are people going to to view me very differently? And and so you're kind of unpacking all of that in in the book. Can you briefly talk about you? You've sort of talked about five different styles of people pleasing because they're not necessarily all the same. And I don't know if um, maybe people might be a sort of a mixture of mm-hmm. one or two styles. So can we talk about the, those five styles? Yeah, so the five styles are gooding, efforting, avoiding, saving, and suffering. And as the names uh, indicate, that's what we use in order to please, you know, being good, effort, avoiding, you know, helping, rescuing, saving others, or suffering. And they're also actually what drive us. And part of the reason why I came up with these five styles is obviously from studying Uh, human behavior and what was driving people over the years, you you see that actually we have so much in common, but one of the sort of prevalent, but two of the prevalent ideas about people pleasing was that it's, that we're at extremes. People were often seeing it as a badge of honor, like it was representative of who they are. Oh, I'm such a people pleaser. You know, Mm -hmm. seeing it as a shorthand for and this kind, wonderful, generous people person who's always doing things for others. And almost as if there was no problem whatsoever with people pleasing. And then at the other end, it was, oh, people pleasing is like being a doormat. And of course, if that's the way that you see people pleasing, then it's very easy to either completely misconstrue it and not recognize actually where some of the things that you're being and doing may not be in your best interests. Or you can end up, for instance, thinking that there's something like seriously wrong with you and putting a lot of shame on yourself. And so with gooding, you are really driven by looking good to others, being perceived as being a good person, a good something. So if you very much about being liked and the idea of being disliked kind of weighs on you a great deal, you are always just trying to be the good version of something, then this is is likely your style. And keep in mind that you can have more than one, but there tends to be one or two that you very much identify with. You may have moved in and out of these different styles depending on where you are in life. Mm -hmm. Efforting, which is my style, very, very dominant style of people pleasing, is you're very much about effort. And so when you have this style, it's not enough for people to to be kind of, you know, be concerned with image. Oh, I just need to look that way. You use your efforts, your bandwidth to be good. And so you overperform, you over deliver, you're always trying to give 100% or more. You're trying to be the best. You're very likely to be a perfectionist and you're also the most likely to burn out. Mm -hmm. And that is because, you know, with people pleasing, no matter what your style is, on some level, you're trying to influence and control other people's feelings and behavior in the hopes that they will, for instance, reward you in some way, or they will just avoid creating conflict, you know, criticism, rejection and so forth. And so when you have that efforting style, there's a part of you that thinks the more effort I make, the more likely it is that I'm going to get something, the more likely it is that I'm going to get what I want, Mm -hmm. which also means that if things don't go the way you want them to go, you think, well, I'm not good enough. I didn't try. Double down. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) exactly. And you double down. If you have the avoiding style, you know, this is, I think is something that when people read the book, they go, oh, because a lot of people don't realize that their avoidance of conflict and criticism is their way of trying to please others. If I don't Mm. talk about that thing, if I don't bring that thing up, if I don't have any needs, if I never cause any discomfort to others, then people will stay. People will love me, people will care about me, or they at the very least won't criticize me or start any conflict with me. And so these can be the people who are very, well, what the person says, well, what do you want? 
well, I want you what you want. What do you like? Oh, I like what you like. And then when sort of the rubber hits the road and for instance, there is an issue or they feel unhappy, they go, but I've done everything that you wanted me to do. I've gone along with everything that you want. And the other person's going, oh, so you didn't actually want to do that. And so uh, there's a lot of us, you know, I have an element of that in me where, oh my gosh, you know, I'm, I'm trained into being absolutely terrified of conflict and I'm not anywhere near as bad as that anymore. But I have a lot of my life was about if I can just avoid that thing. And so I think there'll be, you know, people listening who'd be like, oh, you know, if you pay menopause and menopausal and then, you know, you never want to ask for help and you're, you're hiding all of your needs in your relationships, then you may very well be, you know, an avoider. Saving, I think, is one that people can readily recognize to an extent. You know, if you very much identify with helping, fixing, healing, rescuing as a means to be needed by others, and you tend to be the one who's kind of managing everybody else and taking on everything else, then you very much know this style. But it's also about recognizing that you make this your job because you need to be needed. And it also leads to a lot of resentment because when people don't do what you want them to do, they don't change to the extent that you want them to change. They don't give you the relationship that you want. You feel very put upon. Mm, you don't get and so, back. <laughs> yes, exactly. And you know that the calling card of, of of many a people pleaser is after everything I've done for you, mm. or even if you don't say it, it's thinking it inside. But I've done all of this stuff. Um, people, uh, you know, people listening might recognize it as well. Where you just go out of your way to help her that you didn't necessarily ask if the person specifically wanted you to do that thing, but you kind of bowl in there and you kind of take over the situation. It's like, oh, blah, 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 blah. and the person, because they didn't actually ask you to do this thing, they're like, and so you can feel very kind of like, oh, why aren't I being appreciated? And also when people call you out, you're like, but I had good intentions. And then last but not least is the suffering. And this essentially is, the more this idea that the more you suffer, that the better it makes you as a person. And so it becomes like, I bleed for you. And so in your relationships, you will put yourself in a place of suffering as a way to kind of get that person to see how much you are in need or to show how much you love that person. Oh, that's okay. You just mash up all of my boundaries. You treat me badly. And then it's like, because I've now been treated this badly, because I have suffered this much, surely you owe me a relationship. Surely you owe me some kindness. Surely now it's time for you to meet my needs. And of course, as we all know, that is not how life goes. And do these tend to be these kind of tendencies, uh, things that develop in kind of childhood and sort mm -hmm. of early adulthood? based on family, not just family relationships, but a lot of it comes from that dynamic with within the family. Yeah, you know, this is not about, oh, we're looking to to blame someone, but actually it's it's how we we literally operate as humans, that we are socialized and conditioned into this. In the environments within which we grew up in, we have taken on roles, personas, identities. And so for instance, within our family, maybe because we were the eldest or because we had a sibling or a parent that was irresponsible, we have then gone out of our way, for instance, to make it our job to be over-responsible. If we've seen somebody else is getting a lot of flack for underperforming at school, we may have been like, oh, right, well, I just need to make sure that I'm really good all the time. If we got a lot of praise for um, being good and helping out, um, being of service or bringing in the grades or being popular or something, we take these on as our identity uh, as children. We start to think that it is our job. We look at how can I you know, do my part within the family so that I get attention, affection, approval, love and validation, or so that I avoid conflict, criticism, stress, disappointment and loss. And we pick up we, we replicate these roles at school or within church or within community. And then we get to adulthood and we just continue. And so, for instance, our job in the family may have actually been to be the scapegoat or the problematic one or to be seen as the irresponsible one. Like whatever identity we've taken on, it fits with somebody else's identity within the family. So we learn these roles while growing up and then we just continue until we get enough discomfort, enough pain and problems from playing out this pattern that we finally look at it and go, 
hmm, I wonder if it's time for me to make a change and recognize that some of these things are not working. So in the book, you, you obviously go into a lot more detail about the different styles. Um, but I think one of the things that, that was really helpful as well was when, when you were talking about the, the five individual styles is, is sort of particular calling out things to look out for if you're trying to sort of move away from that. And also these sort of quick shifts and, and, and you've got this sort of troubleshooting, uh, troubleshooting nose, which I think is really helpful because a lot of the time, you know, it's all we kind of go in with good intentions, but then the minute we start to get pushback, it's like, oh god, I don't, I don't know what to do now. So you you perfectly kind of preempted that with a lot of your um, questions. How 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 did you kind of come up with with your your troubleshooting nose within the book? Are they things that have come come out of individuals that you've worked with, or yeah? So um, I, you know, I've been writing baggage reclaim for almost eighteen years, and. I have heard so many stories over the years, in a, a, a really across the, the breadth of situations. And even though I started writing about, you know, mainly talking about romantic relationships initially in my work, what I came to realize is what people were struggling with in their romantic relationships, they were struggling with in all interpersonal relationships, including the one with themselves. And so I understood from all of the conversations that I'd had over the years, all of the various different issues that I kept seeing coming up again, what were the most likely, how should we put it, objections Mm. that some people would have to having healthy boundaries? Not that they were going, oh, boundaries are terrible. In fact, though some people are, but it's more, oh, I get boundaries. I I get that it's important to say no, but what about this? And so these were often these these things that they saw as being the exception or a barrier to, to saying no. And also because, look, I have learned, uh, you know, uh, uh, I don't, I'm not a, a psychologist or a doctor, anything. I've been through the school of life and I have had, I grew up in an environment where boundaries really were a no-no. But I also, to be fair, grew up in a culture of it. I think a lot of us um, did you know uh, in the book I talk about you know we grew up during the age of obedience which is where the communicating disciplining and interacting with children centered on making us very very compliant and so knowing the very specific like oh, I, 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 I do have a, an ability to to pick up on what's going on behind the scenes and what are the what are the places that people are most likely to get stuck because I didn't want people to come away from the book going Well, yeah, she said, you know, it's important to learn to say no, but how? But what about this? But what about that? Yeah. (laughs) And as you're sort of talking about that, I was thinking, you know, I have two kids of my own. So how how can we avoid raising people pleasers? Because I already see a certain kind of elements of the if I'm praising my my younger child who happens to be a a girl for sort of because she seems to be just more likely to help out spontaneously without being asked so you know things like pra- praising people for being good doing good all of that kind of stuff and and um you know they're they're both academically quite bright and do really well at school so it's, it's on the one hand you want to say that's great you're you're <laughs> I love that you're doing well and thank you for helping out but I guess how do we sort of avoid that then putting um, unintended consequences in motion so I, I think, you know, as I say, you know, we are socialized and conditioned in this world to be to be to be people pleasers. And what what we manage to even if our kids, for the most part, weren't getting those people pleasing messages at home, you can be sure, even if we're just specifically looking at England, that based on going into school every day, <laughs> they are going to get some very, very questionable messages about what makes them a, a good and, and worthwhile people be, person. Because, of course, in school, they want to kind of manage a large group of people and make people controllable. Mm-hmm. And you notice that in school, for instance, they give a lot of praise, for instance, to the person who's very clever or the person who gives a whole lot of trouble, but then has one really, really good day, you know. And, and so it's quite fascinating to watch. And so I have two teenage girls. And what you realize is that whether it's coming from yourself or from others, that it is so easy to find yourself saying things sometimes that with the benefit of hindsight, you go, "Hmm." 
you you want to make sure that not course correct that's not the word but you're more aware of how you can say these things and also reinforce the message that they are more than their grades or the jobs that they do around the house so what has been big for us is that we've realized that one of our children is more inclined she's the eldest uh, but she one of our daughters is more inclined to be uh, pleasing than the other. That doesn't mean it's a negative about either one of them. What we have reinforced to her is that it's not her job to try to always be good. Um, that even though she might be praised for being, you know, sweet and lovely and kind and all those things, that if on such a day or a week or a month that she feels like being completely the opposite to that. We'll still love her and we'll still be here for her. So we have let her know that it's okay to be upset. It's okay to be angry. And of course, she does get upset and frustrated. But it's easy when, for instance, you have a younger sibling who can appear to be more assertive, who can sometimes be quite gangster in their approach <laughs> to things, as second children often can be, that to kind of base your personality around that. I talk to lots of people, lots of friends who are like, oh, yeah, you know, it's interesting when you watch your kids, how each of them almost orients themselves around the other in order to, to meet their needs or to communicate certain things about themselves. So we have reinforced the importance of it's okay to express feelings, it's okay to be yourself, but we've also made a point of encouraging ongoing dialogue. Like we have said, there isn't anything that you can't come to us mm. about that doesn't mean you always will come to us because we know what it's like to be a kid ourselves, but we have emphasized that whether it's to us or to somebody else, it's okay to, to talk, to, to be yourself. We've also, and this is, I think, where the, the people-pleasing thing is really helped by us, is that in those instances when they do say no, when they don't always do what we want, what we would prefer, we have made a point about not reacting in the same ways in which our parents' generation, right. for instance, might have done, or our grandparents' generation. And in fact, we were literally talking with a family member at the weekend about um, uh, our nephew, and they were saying, do you know what? We absolutely love that he's like, no, I don't want to do that. No, I don't like that. We were not allowed to do that as kids. <laughs> yeah. the, the great majority of us were not allowed to do that, and that could be a call for like a verbal berating or even a physical punishment. It was seen as being disobedient and rude mm -hmm. and difficult. So it is about, you can't control everything. It is likely that your child is going to have some people pleasing elements, but it is about, because of the world we grow up in, but it is about encouraging your child where possible to express themselves, to be honest about what they need, expect, feel, uh, and, and think, because I think that the more that they they do that is the more that they have the language to have boundaries, the more that they have the language to feel uncomfortable. And if you if you if you if you allow your child to talk to you about the small stuff, they'll come to you about the big stuff. If you're in an ongoing dialogue with your child, and it doesn't have to be perfect, like we all screw up as parents, yeah? But if you're in an ongoing dialogue with your child, if you're willing to listen, if you're willing to kind of pay attention to the patterns, again, it allows you to kind of step in there and be like, hey, you know, I've noticed that, 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 that that's going on. Is everything okay? Because part of people pleasing as a kid can be feeling like, oh, I need to keep that to myself. I need to try to avoid showing that thing because... I might be judged or I don't want to inconvenience my parents. I've said to my eldest, well, and to the youngest as well, because they've sometimes said, oh, I didn't want to bother you with that. Mm. Or, you know, I know that you've got a lot going on. Let us concern ourselves with that. It's not your job don't to take on parental, <laughs> yeah, parental responsibilities. This is our job as parents, you know? So I think that it, that is a big part in changing that. I, you know, we're already in a very different place than to say and our parents and grandparents' generation who keep and beyond. And keep in mind, they were raised in the age of obedience, just like you and I were, Emma, yeah? Mm -hmm. And so, but we're already in a different place in that we have a two-way dialogue with our children as opposed to a one-way one. And I think that as long as you have a two-way dialogue and you are really reinforcing this message of be yourself and also praising 
you know, our children do need praise, but praising them, not just for like, you did like, oh, you're amazing because you did that thing. And so tying like praise to performing, it's like, actually, you know, I really enjoy you as a person and how lovely Mm -hmm. it is that you are this way. And that, yes, you did this thing, but even if you hadn't also done that thing, we would have also still been here for you, you know? And you've got a a chapter sort of later on in the book about reparenting yourself Mm -hmm. can you talk a bit more about that and and you know what what that what does that actually mean when we start to kind of down this journey of getting away from the people pleasing why is it important one of the things that's critical critical for us to recognize is that people pleasing is like a very childlike response to uh, situations that are coming up in our lives because it's what we learn to do as children and anybody who's listened to this will recognize that they have an inner critic, you know, this uh, critical chatter. Um, sometimes what can even be a feeling that says, oh, that's a bad thing and a, and, a, and a no. And we are often using the likes of people pleasing and our inner critic to guide us and discipline us and to tell us what to do. And reparenting is actually having a more conscious you know, loving, caring, trustful, respectful relationship of ourselves, where instead of letting ourselves be run by our inner critic and fear, that we start doing what is our responsibility, which is being our primary caregiver. It's not to say that we don't all as adults have parents, whether they are alive now or they've already passed, but it's at, we are our primary caregiver. So we need to get into a dialogue with ourselves as well. That actually, when we think about somebody else that we love, including, for instance, a small child, would we push and pressure and berate and scold them and say the things to them that we would to ourselves? No, we wouldn't. So it's taking on a a gentler relationship with ourselves by being very conscious about the way that we think about and talk to ourselves. And so we, we start to guide us. And as a result of that, we start to heal those younger parts of ourselves. And you've got a great quote that says, your inner critic will say whatever it takes to stop you from <laughs> going out of your comfort zone. And that that kind of really stopped me in my tracks as well, because, yeah, we're, we're sometimes we're very good at talking ourselves out of things that, that kind of feel like risky or, or kind of growing into particular things um or or even you know the going out of your comfort zone can be stopping that that people pleasing yeah absolutely because your your inner critic you know it's like that person who no matter what it is that you that you say you know for instance you might be like i'm going to i'm going to fly to to edinburgh tomorrow and the inner critic could be like oh but, you know, I've heard that the, that it's going to be like raining, hailstorming thunder tomorrow. And you go, no, I've actually checked the weather forecast and that's not forecast. And then they'll be like, yeah, well, then I've heard that it's going to be a bomb. And then I've heard that and just each time you come back with something. And what you realize is that the inner critic, it, it believes it's trying to protect you. It's like, you know, a recording of of all of the fear experiences, all of the criticisms that you've experienced from others as well as yourself. And so in situations where your body perceives you to be really stepping so much as a millimeter outside of your comfort zone, it it activates that inner critic. And by being more mindful in our relationship with ourselves and entering into this gentle reparenting dialogue with us, then we can allow us to stretch out of our comfort zone, one, without being terrorized, but two, also by taking care of us at the same time. So, you know, take me, for instance, you know, I'm 45 approaching 46. And this reparenting, you know, has been has been really part of the last 17, 18 years of my journey. But I've noticed my 40s is really where it has kicked into gear. Mm. Because I realized I was a I was raised to really not have any limits. And so, you know, if if I said I was tired, I was told to keep pushing on. Um, I was told I wasn't trying hard enough. I was being lazy. It was all about performing. And I get it. You know, my parents thought that they were, what they were doing was the right way, how to drive a person, how to make them successful. But what it's meant is I've woken up in my 40s and I've experienced burnout. Um, on a number of occasions. And when I look back, it was not just been in my 40s, I've experienced it at earlier points as well. But 
now I'm in a dialogue with myself where I'm noticing and going, do you have to do that much? Is it possible that you could claw that back so much? Natalie, you need to slow down. Natalie, you're tired. I'm in bed most evenings by sort of 8, 8.30. Not because I'm necessarily fast asleep at that time, although I do aim to be asleep by sort of 10 o'clock or so, but because I am learning to recognize my limits and, and not push myself to be somebody that I'm not. I would never force my kids to just keep going and going and going, even when they're at the point of exhaustion. There were times when we can push a little bit, but if that's just the way of life, then that's not healthy for us. And I kept overriding my body signals. And to be honest, a few 40s, uh, you know, my father's death a few years ago, perimenopause, all of those things have just said, yeah, you can't really do that anymore. <laughs> yeah, we definitely have to tune in uh, and, and listen to our bodies a lot more. And, and as I say, if you've kind of been through the, uh, I think, uh, Steph Douglas described it in an article the other the other day as the rush hour that kind of you know you've got kind of <laughs> it's not an hour we know that but everyone will kind of recognize that kind of parenting and there's well not everyone will recognize the parenting stuff but definitely the kind of you know the the busy and the always on and then and then mm -hmm. we get to this point we we can't necessarily do all the things multitask get you know keep going hanging out laundry at sort of midnight and then get up at six or or whatever you know, it's like yeah it come, comes a point where you've just got to slow it down a bit so that another thing that um that you talk about is uh, the difference between a hard no and a soft no which I thought was helpful so should we kind of unpack that a little bit what is the difference so um, a hard no is like a no without fluff that doesn't mean that somebody turns around and asks you to do something and you go no although of course that is absolutely fine <laughs> you know that's it's a, it's a complete sentence in and of itself but a hard no is no I can't no I'm not able to it's straight and to the point and it is the no that most people are afraid of it's succinct it's probably you know one it's generally one maybe two sentences that are push a soft no is a no with more detail. And so, for instance, uh, I don't know, I invite you to do an event and you say, no, I can't on this occasion because I've got an event uh, with my daughter, but thank you so much for inviting me. That is a soft no. What a lot of people think they're doing and, and they're assuming with their nose that this is soft no is that they are making theirs into a fluffy or what I almost call a flaccid no, where they add so much detail because they are feeling they feel bad. apologetic <laughs> and shameful about saying no. And I think sometimes as well, it's almost like if I load them up with so much information about this, they'll regret having asked I'll me leave the first me alone. Thing, leave me alone. <laughs> and so it's like, um, hey, Emma, you know, can you um, do this particular thing for me? Well, you know, my cat got stuck up a tree and, you know, I've got all of this stuff going on and my grandma this and, you know, if I wasn't feeling this, but then, yeah, probably I could turn. And next thing you know, you've been talking for what might feel like an eternity and the other person's going, so are you saying no or are you saying yes? But also it's like this unburdening of yourself. And so, I encourage people to use a hard no with people who you don't know very well or you do know and they are likely to try to push you some more on, on your no. You can use a soft no, not the fluffy, flaccid <laughs> no, the by the way. <laughs> yeah, but, but like you can use a soft no, for instance, with family, friends, as in loved ones who respect your boundaries, right? And save the, the hard no for people who keep pushing or for situations where you just need to be absolutely clear and not give additional detail. Because mm -hmm. most of the time, unless somebody is shady, they just want you to get, you know, cut to the chase. And, you know, one of my, and I think I say this in the book as well, like I always know that something is up if I'm replying to a text or an email um, and it should be in theory, like one, two, three lines, but I'm still trying to compose this message like 20 minutes later, because I know then that I've gone into that soft no territory and that I'm clearly trying to find the perfect words. A lot of the time we're trying to let people down gently and avoid hurting feelings and that is how we get into those sort of problematic mm. no's and is that that's more about us presumably than it is about them yeah when we're saying 
and I know some people who hear what I'm about to say next, but, like, oh, but you know, when we're like, oh, but you know, the reason why I didn't tell them the truth or the reason why, you know, I've avoided saying no is because I don't want to hurt their feelings and I'm letting them down gently. No, you don't want to hurt your feelings mm. you're trying to let it like let them down gently because you're trying to let yourself down gently no with like, a side of people pleasing <laughs> yes exactly exactly and, and there's another uh tactic there for for anyone who's uh getting into the the sort of the the joy of saying no um which is the the power of the pause the 10 second pause uh, which I think is, is is good because a lot of the time, you know, we are so busy that we're kind of, we, we're knee jerk responding to stuff. Mm-hmm. So I think that, you you know, you talk about having that sort of giving yourself that time to, to actually kind of feel that sort of how you want to respond in your body and giving yourself that time to, to sort of think that through rather than you know if you've got a tendency to be Mm -hmm. like you know perhaps like I have definitely been in the past and kind of like oh yeah I'll do that without actually thinking about you know (laughs) what if I just agreed to here you know like (laughs) this is this is something that's going to take me four hours or a day or I'm going to have to do it you know once a week for (laughs) for the rest of my life (laughs) but (laughs) I think a lot of the time you know we we are we do make these snap decisions so uh, yeah it's um you know a lot of us if if you say yes and then immediately go, oh, flip, like, what the hell have I done? You're already trying to work out in your head how to get out of things. You're panicking, you're fuming. Or you say yes without considering the meaning and consequences of doing so, you know, the impact of doing so. And and if you have a habit, you know, this comes about a lot of people pleasers reflexively mm. say yes. And that is the saying yes without really thinking about it or the yes and then panicking afterwards. Adding even a momentary pause allows you to notice how your body is in that moment. Because a lot of, with people pleasing, we are responding to anxiety and to tension, not to what's actually going on. We're not noticing what's going on in our body, but also more importantly, do I have the bandwidth to do this? Uh, What have I already committed to? Uh, Do I actually want to do this I mean I know it seems so elementary but a lot of the time we don't even consider not even whether we just want to do it do we even need to do it I mean I hate to break it to all of us but here's the truth there is somebody else that can volunteer themselves for this stuff we often behave as if we are the only person who can do so I mean I do this at home sometimes like where like yesterday I wasn't feeling too great and in the evening I suddenly remembered that I had the, the white wash still sitting in the wash machine and it had obviously the kids school shirts for today and so then my husband's like what are you doing I said I'm just going to go and pick up uh some laundry out of the out of the wash machine and he goes I can do that and then I found myself going oh well are you sure and then and, and it, it's okay I can do it and he's like no it's fine you've not been well I'm sure it's everyone's fine. nodding along where's it yeah <laughs> As I am. <laughs> and then I was like, why am I behaving like I'm literally the only person who can take this stuff out of the washing machine? Now, granted, he didn't look in the washing to work out which things are not supposed to go in the tumble dryer. He just got very lucky this time that nothing actually <laughs> happened to those few items that were in there. But the point is, is that we need to notice where we kind of carry on like we are literally the only person on earth that could possibly deal with this thing. Because a lot of the time we're not. I think one of the, um, as a sort of a closing reflection, because we haven't really talked about this, but you do talk about it in the book. Uh, uh, people will maybe think about the sort of, you know, the, the, the act of saying no is a very negative thing when actually what we're really doing is making space for the things that we want to say yes to. And that sort of wholehearted yes. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I I think a lot of us uh, have internalized this idea that that no makes us selfish and difficult or rude or narcissistic or whatever it is that we associate it with. And and actually, you know, if we think that that way about us saying no, we also need to acknowledge that that's how we feel about other people saying no to mm. us. But if we think of that yes and no 
are, are, are interrelated. What we say yes to means that we're saying no to something else and vice versa. And so you think, think of like that, the heart and the lungs, they work together to pump oxygen rich blood around the body and they need each other. And when one or both are compromised, then it affects the whole system. It is the same with yes and no. And learning to say no when we need, want to, and should means that we also say yes more authentically. And by saying no to the things that really are not a fit for us, but also saying no to, to because we're respecting ourselves and respecting our bandwidth, we open ourselves up to so much more. I think we see, we're like, oh my God, I'm going to miss out or people are going to judge me. Actually, it receives so much more as a result of learning to say no. And I, I would, I really want people to see the possibilities and to recognize where saying no has gifted them with something else. Well, that's a great point to finish on. Natalie, thank you so much. I can't believe that 40 minutes has flown by so quickly. <laughs> The Joy of Saying No is out now on Harper Horizon Books uh, and people can find you at baggagereclaim.com, uh, which is the uh, the blog. And presumably there's a link there. They can find the podcast or, or search for that yes. on the uh, Baggage Reclaim sessions. Natalie, thank you. I, I've so enjoyed talking to you. I so enjoyed talking to you as well, Emma. Thank you so much for having me. You've been listening to the Middling Along podcast. Do remember to subscribe to be notified when the next episode is live. And why not visit the blog at www.middlingalong.com to sign up to my newsletter as well. I do hope you enjoyed listening today. If you did, I'd be really grateful if you would consider leaving a short review as that helps people find the podcast and helps get it noticed. Hope you can join us next time. Goodbye for now.